us just pray this morning over the word that the Lord wants to release to you because I'm just so excited. I saw myself doing somersaults and just like I saw myself, I used to preach in Elsie's River. I'm like, Lord, where does that come from? Why are you showing me that? And he says, I'm sparking you up again. I'm like, look, I've been okay. I don't need to be sparked up. He says, no, I'm just bringing back another spark. So he's redefining our our original gift. He's saying he's reworking it, remodeling it, and just redoing everything. I like that re, re something. So he is redoing, reworking, reviving, resetting, and re everything. Amen. So reigniting. So Father, we honor you, Lord, and we bless your holy name. We worship you. We thank you for this beautiful day. And Father, I thank you, Lord God, that as your word goes forth, that will go forth unhindered by any demonic force, oh God, any influences, God, even any destructive spirits, oh Lord, hindering spirits that will come and hover over your people. They are not welcome here, Lord. We cut them off today. In the name of Jesus, we command you right now out, out of this place, off of the people of God, in Jesus' mighty name. So Lord, I surrender to you. Every faculty, God, my thought, my mind, will, and emotion, I hand it all to you, Father. I ask you to come, Holy Spirit. Speak through me, Lord, in the mighty name of Jesus to these, your people. And we give you alone all the glory, the honor, and the praise for everything that you will do here today, Father. Everything, Lord. Angels, thank you for your presence. <laughs> ah, thank you, thank you. That's like, are they standing like ready writers with their books? I don't know what's happening. Lord, I don't know what's happening. I know it's recorded, everything we're doing. It's like I'm being inspected today, God. And I'm not going to be paying attention to them, Father. I'm going to just focus on you this morning, Lord. I know that they're here to cheer me on and just to help me get focused on what you want to do today, Lord. So, Father, I bless you and I thank you for everything, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Oh, I just saw a whole row of them standing there with their books. Like, hello, I'm ready to write. So this morning they were singing, and now they're ready to write. Are you all ready to write? You better get your pens out and get ready to write. Hallelujah. I'm getting a bit of an American. You all here now today. Yeah, listen to Americans. Amen. Praise God. So what is it that the Lord would say to us today? The one thing that I heard in my spirit a few weeks ago, I was going on for the things that I was speaking to you about, how God is bringing us into reshaping, remodeling us. And he was speaking about who will come to the holy mountain. We were speaking about the mountain of the Lord. And um, so I'm seeing some of you that have already started being the bridge, the bridge from the community to the church. You're bringing people to up to the holy mountain. So thank God for your, for your passion and for your heartbeat. So we were speaking about that and coming into this time of preparation where we are fasting and praying for personal breakthrough, for spiritual breakthrough, for financial breakthrough, for every kind of breakthrough. But most importantly, the fast is to draw us closer to God. The fast is so that we can hear God and follow His leading and His guidance. When I first started fasting, I tell you what, my first fast was at Esther fast. Three days, total abstinence. I thought I was going to faint, but I did not. The Lord says, do not cast away your confidence I have confidence in you, God, that we can do this. And I did a three-day total abstinence, and I already experienced the goodness of the Lord. The first thing that I recognized on my three-day total abstinence was my vocabulary changed. I never spoke, said the same words I used to use before. No more curse words, no more even small swear words or anything like that. Sometimes we, I mean, we get born again, but our spirits are born again, but our, ma our, our, our character still is a bit of a tweaking and a working on. Come on, we haven't all arrived. So at that time for me, everything changed. I changed the way I looked at people. This other thing that happened to me was I never got angry. I never, people would say things and like what, would, what used to make me angry, even my kids would irritate me or they'd say something. I was just more passive. I was like, Okay, that's how you want to do it. And I realized that is how Jesus is. So the reason why we say live a fasted life, saying keep yourself in check. Because you crucify the flesh. Your flesh always wants to do things. The flesh will always want to retaliate. The flesh will always want to do something that is totally contrary to what God wants us to do. Or to what he desires us to do. Like I said the other day, and I mean, we all know this, that whatever we do on this earth is already recorded in heaven. But before we were sent to earth, the book was written for our lives on what we're going to do, 
when we hit the earth. So there, Belinda's believing for a baby, and these angels are in heaven and say, no, that book belongs to me. Yes, that's your book. Okay, I'm sending this book to Belinda. So Belinda got the book called AJ when she was impregnated. So AJ and his book went into her womb. So God said, now you nurture the child. And when the child is born, the child will walk in these ways. But if the mother doesn't work, work with the child and train the child in the way they should go, then they're going to turn out differently to what they are supposed to be. So the child isn't raised in the admonition of the Lord, and they're not raised in a Christian environment, and if they don't understand the biblical principles, they will never be able to fulfill their purpose or walk in their destiny. So as a parent, you've got to ask the Lord, Lord, what is in the book for this child? Why have you given me this child? What is this child's purpose? And you will see with what the child is doing in their lives growing up. And this is why I said, when you are small, what is it that you loved doing when you were a child? The world and the parents and people in the schools have taken the child's genius, their creativity that God's placed in them. They've been raped from their innocence, many children. When I was molested at the age of five, I believe my innocence and my, gen my genius was somehow taken away from me because then I started growing up becoming a very sad, depressed, lonely individual. And I was filled with fear because of these things that happened to me. So that was the enemy's plan to destroy my life. But I thank God. That he saved me just in time. Because if I had to grow up older, I would have probably still been a mess and been on drugs or lived a different kind of life. But God had destiny fulfilled in my life. He said to me, this is who I called you to be. And I couldn't believe it. I said, God, you mean me stand on stages? Are you crazy? I mean, at the age of 18, it was already told to me, I'm going to be a speaker. I'm going to be speaking to thousands of people. And I didn't know what it meant. I thought because of the job that I had, I was lecturing and I was going places, teaching people on my work. And I was speaking to lots of people. I thought that was it, but it wasn't. It was the ministry to which God had called me. So when I go preach international, wherever I travel, I see the vision unfolding before me all the time. And the enemy tried to shut me up. He tried to put me in a box. He wanted me to probably end up in a mental institution. When my ex-husband beat me to a pulp, I thought, I'm going to die. He tried to disfigure my face and my entire body. When I ended up in the hospital, I looked at myself in the mirror and I said, Lord, I don't know who this person is. I didn't look like me. I didn't feel like me. And I felt like I wanted to die because I had a death wish on my life. The curse that was spoken over me when I was a child. So you see, these are the things that I had that, had that the enemy will try and bring into your life to deter you, to take you off of the path where God wants you. When the Lord says he's put before you the narrow path, very few people walk on that narrow path because now I want to taste what the world tastes like. Oh, there's something nice. Let me just go off that way. And that is where the animals will chew you up. The enemy will devour you if you don't stay on your path. So what is the, 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 the purpose of this message today? I'm saying that God has a purpose and a plan for your life. He has predestined you. But what is your decree? What is it that you say? What is it that you will confess? No matter what happened to you, no matter how you feel, no matter what's happening around you, the topic for today's message is what will you decree? When Esther was being prepared for her groom. She didn't know what was going to happen. He gave her the permission. He said, you've been faithful. You've been highly favored. You've done everything you could. Now you write the new decree. What will you say when they ask about you? What will you say when they ask about your partner? What will you say when anyone asks you about anyone else? What will you decree? But here's the thing. I want to quickly just give you the scripture in case those of you who want to know what the scriptures are for today. Anyway, Corinthians chapter 4 verse 17. It says, for this reason, I've sent Timothy to you who is my beloved and faithful son in the Lord, who will remind you. He said, now I'm, I'm going to just put you rephrases. It's for this reason, I've sent Terry to you today who is my beloved and faithful daughter in the Lord, who will remind you of my ways in Christ as I teach everywhere in every church. The Lord is reminding you that he sent me his beloved daughter. He calls me the, apples, the apple of his eye. He says that I am his favorite one. I don't know what he says about you. 
He calls me my beloved daughter. Sometimes he says to me, honey. And I said, no, it's not my husband. He says, no, you're my honey. Yeah, I'm his honey. And then in 1 Corinthians 1 verse 17, it'll be part of the scripture. It says, lest the cross of Christ should be made of no effect. Lest the cross of Christ be made of no effect. Many people crucify Jesus every day. Every day. They're born again. They acknowledge that Jesus is the Son of God and they believe that He's died and He rose again and that He will come again in glory. But now problems come, things happen, and then their faith has gone out by the back door and they start running to loan sharks and they start uh, gossiping about people and they start doing all sorts of things. And then they say, oh, I don't know what I'm going to do today. I don't know where my food's going to come from. It's like, now what did Jesus die for? Oh, the sickness is going to kill me. You know, I don't know how I'm feeling today. I'm so sick. I'm going to the hospital. I need to... What did Jesus die for? Oh, I'm so tormented today. I don't know what's going on. I'm full of fear and um, anxiety and all of that. You know, tomorrow is going to be... And, and, and like I shared the other night, I got this revelation on the Monday morning. The Lord said, if you're worrying about things and if you're anxious about stuff, you're living in the future. But if you're full of resentment and unforgiveness, you're living in the past. So you are forgetting and missing. You can't embrace your present. So forget about the past. So you can not be anxious about the future. So you can move on with and get busy with what you're supposed to do now. So we get into that place where you're saying, God, I'm not going to make the cross to no effect. Jesus, you, you paid it all. I had a few ladies over at my house yesterday, and we started out by having Holy Communion. And I said, you know, guys, I just... I just want to, I mean, I said to the girls, guys, I said, guys, you know, I just want to remind, let us just be reminded about who Jesus really is and what he's done. He said, remember my death. Many just want to remember the resurrection and he's alive, he's alive. Yes, yes, yes. But he says, remember my death until I come again. Do this as often as you come together. As often as you come together. That means all the time because we get together often. And do this in remembrance of me. So we remember the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. But most times people just want to remember the resurrection. But the death is making the cross effective. We're saying Jesus is alive and he can do all of these things. So yes, what is your decree? What will you say? And what led me to this message was this. That when you get rooted... The enemy will do what he can to take that from you. He calls your doubts and your fears. He calls you on the things that is your weak link to try and get you away from what God has for you. God's answer for deliverance is in the cross. He has angels assigned to you. And sometimes we forget about these good things that God has given us because we are so focused in where we are right now, what we are feeling, what we are thinking. But remember I said on New Year's Eve, sometimes you need to go back so that you can go forward. You have to go and fix up a few relationships, go and restore and revive, rekindle, remake restoration and, and all of that so that you can move forward. And this is the thing because this year the Lord is talking about um, things that we have to do, which is a lot of it is in the booklet. But on Friday evening, I had this vision in prayer that limitations were being lifted off of people. I saw the congregation knocking the sea roof, the ceiling of the church up. And as they were knocking the ceiling, it's like someone was trying to press it down. It's like evil forces were trying to keep the ceiling, the roof down. But the people were knocking and eventually through our worship, through our prayer, the prayer, the force of that power behind the unity in the body of Christ coming into one purpose, one vision, one goal, that roof lifted. And the Lord says, I'm removing all limitations. And this is why I felt so impressed in my heart to bring this message to you. Because the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 6 and 7. How many of you know that God chastises those whom he loves? 
Hello? God chastises those whom he loves. God will talk to you about you. Sometimes he talks to the prophets about you, and the prophets don't always tell you about you because I won't always tell you what God shows me. I will rather say, God, you tell them, you show them, but if you want me to do it in your time, let me keep my mouth shut and pray it through until you release it to me to tell them. So Hebrews, sorry, where am I? Hebrews 12. God will talk to you about you. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. And every son whom he receiveth, uh, and scourges every son whom he receives. If you endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? Why did I not choose the old version? Anyway, who, why are you that the Lord would chasten you not? But what son whom the father has chastened? I would prefer God to chastise me than for man. It's very hard, very difficult when, hello, when I, I, know, I know a lot of you have been chastised by us in, in leadership because we have to, we're just helping you, but in a loving way, in the right way, right? I haven't chastised you where you want to run away and not come back, right? You're still here. Amen. I mean, it wasn't a chast- ch- chastening of the Lord is much better. When the Lord says, you've got to do it like this, do that and that, I better just do it like that. Or he'll chasten me about something and I will fix it up very quickly. So sometimes the Lord will chastise you about things that will help you get you into your position. And sometimes he uses people like us here to help you. I don't call the call out names, but if the shoe fits, you wear it. If it's something that you've been praying about and something you need healing and deliverance for, take it. Because, you know, God will always make it work through us first before we can actually deliver the message to you. You know? So, um, yeah, let me just get back into that. Because the thing is, what we de- decree is important because many people suffer for the lack of knowledge. In Isaiah chapter 4 verse 6, my people suffer for lack of knowledge. They're not getting their breakthrough because there are so so many hindrances in their lives. So I'm going to try and and get to the the sweet part of this message because there's so much content that I've put in here over the past few days. I'm like, okay, God, let me just stay where you want me to go with today. So he says, there's death and life is in the power of the tongue. What is it that you will make your decree? How will you decree what you should Besides, Proverbs 18.21, we are continually prophesying either life or death into a situation. So what is, your, what, what is your prophecy? What is it that you're saying to yourself? What is your prophetic word for your life, for your ministry, for your family? What prophecy do you have written on your wall? What? What are you gazing upon every day? What is your spoken word for your life for this year? And this year, my word is victory. I will, be in, I will have victory in everything of my life. Not that I didn't before, but I'm just pressing in more and more because I need a lot of victory in a lot of areas for my family, for the ministry and everything. So this is the thing. Life and death is in the power of the tongue. And they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. They that love it. So in Deuteronomy it says, I place before you death and life. Blessing and cursing you choose. So the choice is easy. It's simple. We choose life. We choose the blessing. We choose to speak the good things. But now this is a thing that Jesus says to us. In Luke 13, verse 23 and 24, I will read it to you. Jesus then said one, then he said unto him, Lord, are there few that be saved? And he said unto them, verse 24, strive, strive. The other said things for more. The other, what's it? You know, right? Yeah, I cream no right. The other said things for more. Strive to enter in. At the straight gate. For many I say unto you. Will seek to enter in. And shall not be able. Many seek to enter in the narrow gate. But they will not be able. Why? Why do you think they will not be able to enter in? Showed you the picture on Tuesday night. Because. Because. 
All their bags are so big and heavy and weighty around them. The gate is too narrow because they don't want to let go of that offense. They don't want to let go of that unforgiveness. They don't want to let go of hatred and sadness and depression and anxieties and all of that. They don't want to let go of their lusts of the flesh. So they cannot enter the narrow gate. And sad to say, preachers, pastors, Christians, some of them have not yet entered the narrow gates. They're still walking out on the courts. And the Bible says to us that there's room for you at the cross. This may sound like an evangelistic message tonight, but it's today it's for a purpose for you because as you're entering into the fast, you will understand what it is I'm talking about, what it is God is preparing you for. So looking at what God is saying, uh, my prayer was, Holy Spirit, that you would move upon your people in a way like never before so they can receive the fullness of your love and your abundance and your peace that you have in store for them in this time. That they will step over the threshold of darkness into his marvelous light. And I know God is speaking to someone here today. Make every effort to enter through the narrow gate. We all know the ABCs of, of the gospel. We all know how to, to present the gospel to other people and tell them about the saving grace of Jesus. But are we walking on the narrow path? Have we entered that narrow gate? Some hasn't. They haven't. They are not there yet. Because many times he says, pride can save, stop us from going there. The Bible says, no man can come to the Father, Jesus said, except through me. They want to get to the Father through good works, by doing good for other people. That's not going to get you into heaven. That's not going to get you through the gate. It's not the key. We all sin and fall short of the glory of God. People do things for, to be seen by man, and they act in the operation. They operate with a self-righteous spirit. Oh, I don't want to worry what, what the church is doing. You know, I'm going to do my own thing over here. Self-righteous? Hello? Get with the vision of the church. God has called us to do something. You can't go and do what the church is doing out there on your own unless you're doing it in your group and, and saying, listen, our group is going out, Prophet. We need to just let you know, cover us. Great. We know where you are at. You're not operating on your own. And causing to, to walk in a place of, we're saying this to help and protect you. I don't want to control anyone. But we need to protect you from the wolves out there that will make you think, hey, it's okay. Then they're going to call you up and, hey, can you come and do it here by me next week? At the end of the day, what happened is that wolf that is coming, that, drew, that was drawing you out, he had pulled you out of the sheepfold and you're going to be devoured out there because you're now moving out of your lane. And then things are not going to be working out in a way that it, it should be. You will prosper, yes, but not the way you should have prospered because God has called you to run in the lane with that particular thing for the church. You might be a media fundi, and God is saying, bring your creativity to the ministry because that is where the church is going. But you want to take it somewhere else, and God is saying, I'm going to let that fall flat. You'll see. So I can bring you back to where you ought to be. You'll see. I'm just using an example, right? So the Lord says we all sin and fall short of the glory of God. He is the door and he watches over you. That oversized baggage and things you need to let go because it's holding you back. And it's not going to get you onto the place where you should be. Enter in, the Bible says. Enter in, Matthew eleven twenty eight. Come to me, all of you are heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. Don't pick it up again. Don't pick up those the baggages again. Come to me, says the Lord in Matthew eleven twenty eight. All who are heavy burdened. So whatever your burden is this morning, go to God and tell him. I came to this message to tell you this. I've wrestled through something for many years. In the part of the booklet, I was speaking to you about the infirmity that I was afflicted with. And the Lord gave me this revelation. And um, he said to me, I, I couldn't understand why I've been thinking of this particular friend I had at high school. And... Um, she had an abortion, and I felt like the Lord was saying to me, you've been an accomplice to a murder. 
And what happened was that murderous spirit came upon me as a young girl. So the, what, what goes before a murderous spirit? Anyway, what goes before a murderous spirit is a spirit of fear. It's like a prerequisite. What you have to have to be a murderer, to, to be, do murder, is to be, have fear. So I, was, I grew up as, with fear as a child through the molestation, through the abuse, through domestic violence in our home and everything. So that fear, I was, con I was controlled by the spirit of fear, which was a prerequisite, a, something that had to have before the spirit of murder could come upon me. So what happened with that was, um, as time went on, you heard about my testimony and things like that. So what the Lord showed me in that entire passage as he unveiled this journey, this vision, this movie that was playing, he said to me, you have been operating with a familiar spirit. So I was working out territorial demons, spiritual mapping, all of these things, preparing and all of that. So all the years while I was preparing this booklet, this familiar spirit thing comes up each time we meet on doing encounters. And the strange thing is when I look at the time when we get to the, the, the familiar spirit teaching of, of all these um, um, evil things that come upon people and that is hovering around the earth, how it consumes people. And, and I keep on saying to Pastor, I want to be able to do this particular activation. But the particular thing that the Lord gave me this revelation of the familiar spirit for my own life, and I want you to hear me and hear me well. A familiar spirit is something that you exalt higher and bigger than your own partner, your, your, your children, or even God. So what happens is you get an, an affliction or the doctor gives you a report. Let's say the doctor says to you, hey, you've got cancer, and I just want you to know that you need to go on this treatment and that treatment. What happens with cancerous patients? Immediately they have a thought of death. And immediately they think of, oh, this is not going to work. Uh, I have to do all of this and I have to take this medication. And every time we get to see them, all they talk about is their cancer. All they talk about is their medication. All they talk about is you mustn't eat this, you mustn't eat that, because that's going to happen to you and you're going to get sick. Everything in their life, every moment you're with them, they're talking about their cancer. They're talking about their marital problem. They're talking about their child is, that is uh, in, in bondage. Or they're talking about a rebellion. Or they're talking about someone who has wronged them. Or they're talking about someone who, who, who is busy stealing from them. Whatever it is, that is your infirmity. It doesn't have to be a sickness. Your infirmity can be a torment in the mind where you are believing a lie. The enemy is telling you about yourself. Hey, you're never going to make it. You, what? You call for the pulpit? Are you kidding me? That lie is what is, that is a tormenting thought. That is coming to alignment with a familiar spirit. Because the, here's the key. Listen to what you've been saying. What have you been decreeing? What have you been saying to people about your own life? What do people talk about when you come into their company? What is flowing out of their spirit? Because the Bible says what the heart is full of, the mouth will speak. And listen, I'm not coming or getting on to anyone here. I'm just telling you of my own personal testimony. I'm saying this to help you. Because a familiar spirit is sometimes assigned to you when you are born. Many times people are operating with familiar spirit because it's a family heirloom. It's a family thing. No, in this family we do it like that. That's a familiar spirit. So your life, you walk around, oh, no, I've got to do it like this, and this is how we dress, and this is how we talk, and, and this is how we eat, and this is how we do things. So am I helping somebody here today? Now, the Lord wants to, today, he said, today is the day that he wants to help some of you get rid of that familiar spirit because it's been tormenting you. It's been holding you back. He's got his tentacles in you like that. All over, mind, eyes, all over your body. He's, I see, you know, you're just so controlled. How many of you have seen the Matrix? You know, when they put that thing behind your neck and that thing controls them. 
It's like the matrix, like the enemy's got you sucked in like that. So when someone sent in, a, in the prayer group the other night about people bound, saw people bound, I can't remember who it was. I saw it in a group yesterday. I was looking at all the, re, the, the things that came out of prayer. People were bound by certain things. I know, I know all the words, but they were bound, particularly here today for Mama's Bread. It was a prayer specific for Mama's Bread. So the Lord is wanting to set you free today because God is bringing us together to share his truth. Amen. He's, we're not here to judge anyone. The truth is a lot of people are even thinking, and I have to mention this again because the Lord gave it to me this morning, and I said, but Lord, I have to just say it the way it is. People are thinking that doing Christian yoga is okay. It's not okay. You're awakening a kundalini spirit. And it's all gone into the new age and all of that. I'm not going to give you the entire teaching. You can, you can get it when you come on to the encounter. And all of these things are coming into against God's will for us. We are saying, Jesus, you don't heal me then. I am rather going to go for yoga and do the other mantras and stuff and, and try all various sources of healing because Jesus is taking too long. That's making the cross to no effect. And God had to chastise me. And for years, while I was trying to research what it is, why did I get this disease? Why did I have this God? Why? Why do you want? And I thought God wanted to take me out. I thought I was supposed to die. But he says, no, it's not what I have for you. You know? It's not what I have for you. I want you to be in peace. I want you to be in my perfect will. And I to take this journey with the Lord. I to take the journey with the Lord and say, okay, God, it's you and I now. Let me put my feet in the ground. And I became like that, that boo, you know, is about to now. So you're kicking up the sand. I'm like, God, I'm getting into, back into that racing track again. Just get me back into the rhythm. Get me back into that groove again, God. Because your word says that I am more than a conqueror because of Christ who strengthens me. 1 Peter 2, 23 says that by your stripes I am healed. I cut off every lie from the enemy. God, I believe your word. And in the morning I had to confess. I had to come into alignment with, with God's word and cut off the lie of the enemy. I said, you remove your tentacles from me. You will not come and harass me. All your tormenting spirits and demons of hell, infirmity, get out of me. Get off of me. You have no landing strip. This is a child of God, and I'm under the blood of Jesus. You cannot touch me. The Bible says those who are, are called by my name will do mighty exploits. And I said, Lord, mighty exploits. This is mighty exploit. Let me be in this position, God, to strengthen me and pull me back. And I got back, and I said, Lord, like I used to put my, 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 my spikes on when I did athletics, I put on my spikes, and those spikes sticks into that, that starting blocks. And I said, Lord, now, now I'm putting on my, my, my gospel shoes. The preparation with the gospel of peace. I needed to be at peace with what I was doing. I couldn't let fear and doubt and unbelief and, and make the cross to no effect. Because where's the song? I said, be magnified in my life, O Lord. The song, that song's word starts off with, I have made you too small in my eyes. O Lord, forgive me. And I have believed in a lie that you were unable to help me. But now, O oh Lord, I see my wrong. Heal my heart and show yourself strong. I've believed in a lie. Because I was so desperate, I was researching my own ailment. And the devil just made it so big. And I have to try this drug. I have to try this uh, um, the other drug. Then I, I can't tell you how much money we spent on drugs. So for the past 12 years, since the, the, the time the sad, the bad news came, I'm like, oh, no, 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 no. This is not going to work. This is not how God wants it to work. But I thank the Lord that each time I started putting those spikes into that starting blocks, and I kept on saying, Lord, it's your will, not my will, Father God. You said that I'm a victor in every situation. So today, I choose your word. I will walk circumspectly. I will not forego off by the wayside where someone has given me a nice invitation to do this and that. And I have to say no to some invitations. And I have to say yes to what God wanted as hard and as difficult as it was. I had to pick up the cross so that I could just follow him. 
I had to be so aligned and focused into what he's called me to do and not think of what others are saying or calling out to be. The specialists and the doctors will always try and give you drugs and things. They don't even know that the drugs is not going to help because they are not nutritionists or druggists or whatever. They just give what the drug uh, companies give them. How many of you are on medication that you're taking? Some people die because of the side effects of the medication, not the actual ailment. My dad went that way. He never died of what he was sick of. He died because of the side effects of the medication. And I'm not saying stop your medication. I made it very clear in the booklet. I'm not saying stop your medication. I'm saying ask the Lord and speak to your doctor if, you, if it's okay that you can eat these certain things. If, he, if they guide you in other ways, just follow their leading and their guidance. We're not saying don't put away your medication. We're not saying be foolish. Hello, we don't want no death here in the church. Hallelujah. A preemptive, pre, what do you call it, premature deaths? No. So some of you haven't moved into the place where you're supposed to be for your jobs, for your, for your ministry and whatever. You know, God is saying, don't be caught up in these things. There's healing through the blood of Jesus. There's power in the tongue. There's power in your decree. What will you say? Don't say, I have this because my uncle has it. You know, my grandma had this disease, and now that's why I have it. It's in the family. Nonsense. Don't believe that lie. Don't come into agreement with the enemy. He's placing a curse upon you. You know, religious demons pull curses upon themselves every day. They, I will say, some, I mean, our family, you've blessed the Lord. We were all religious at one time. Thank God he delivered us. They, what, the religious people, they, you see, there are two types of Christians. There are ones that believe. They believe in the word of God, and then there are others that believe, but they don't really believe. Because they don't believe in the power of healing. They don't believe it. So I go to my one aunt, and she says, I say to her, oh, you got a sore leg, come let me pray for you. No, you know, we don't believe in that. Our church doesn't believe in it. And I'm like, oh, well, you've just spoken a curse on yourself. Keep it then, keep your pain. Great, I know I can wave a goodbye if I were you, you know. So how do we deal with these people? We can't because the religious demon, they are strong. They are headstrong. I mean, there are some people who have the seal of, of someone else on them. And like, I rather want to have the seal of Jesus on me than have the seal of that person. I don't want a man's seal upon me. Oh, no, sweet Jesus. Hallelujah. So these t <laughs> tormenting spirits and whatever, God help us. We have, to get, we have to get rid of it. The enemy lies and they cause people to dwell on those negative thoughts of death. And I had to continually say, you're tormenting spirits, you're spirits of death, of murder and corruption, get out of my life, get off of, out of my mind. And I haven't thought of it for years because I know the Lord has set me free from it. You know, so ask yourself, what is it that God is wanting to set you free today? What do you have to renounce today from that spirit of, of, of um, um, uh, this familiar spirit so that God's joy can be replaced in it? We live in a fallen world, family. We live in a fallen world. But we don't have to be living in a world that we can be defeated. So these things have been hindering your walk. Religious spirits, familiar spirits. They hinder your walk and they hinder you and stop you trying to prevent you from getting your breakthrough. I'll get into alignment with the Holy Spirit today. And this is the alignment that God is causing His children to walk in for this 2020. You want to walk into the purpose that God has called you. You want to say, angels, you are allowed to go and read my book and come and bring to me what belongs to me so I can fulfill the mandate God's given me. And I said, the only way you're going to get that is through prayer and through fasting. So you can cut off your own selfish desires, cut off the evil thoughts and cut off all the lies and deceptions the enemy's, enemy's been given you. So you need to renounce these familiar spirits of sickness in the name of Jesus. You need to dethrone them. Today you will dethrone them. You've been lifting them too high. You've been lifting them higher than Jesus. So you're saying, I'm making the cross to no effect. You've been making your problem so big so that Jesus can't do what he's supposed to do. So the chorus of that song, it says, be magnified, O Lord. You are highly exalted. There's nothing that you cannot do. O Lord, be magnified. 
And it's a beautiful song. I think I sang it here one morning. I'm not going to attempt to sing it today because I don't feel the unction of the Holy Spirit on my voice. You know, I wanted to sing it in the angelic tones, but praise the Lord. Ha, ah, hallelujah. Praise God. So I just pray this morning that you will receive what the Lord wants to say to you about these hindrances in your life and that you will be able to walk in the manifestation of His love, of His provision, of His purpose. For, uh, and his plan for your life so that you can walk free from everything that has been holding you, been holding you back. Amen. Amen. I know the Lord is speaking to some of you today, if not all of us, because a lot of people feel that they have not been able to take that step over the threshold out of that dark, tormenting place and say, Lord, I step into the light of what it is that you have for me. Jesus, I will not make the cross to no effect. I will renounce everything that I've been worshiping. Renounce familiar spirits and demons activity in my life. And if that is you, I want you all to stand this morning. I believe the Lord wants to set some people free so that you can move into this fast without having any hindrances and that you will walk in victory and declare Jesus as king for that is who he really is. Amen.